to say, I knew this was going to happen, but I just didn't do anything about it. I stood there like a deer in headlights. It's not difficult. It shouldn't be scary. This is not Armageddon. This is saying the sun's going to come up the day after the dollar paradigm ends. It's a question, have you taken the steps necessary to be ready so that your family can have great opportunities for the future? Hey, my friends, with all the craziness going on around the Holy Land, uh, still in Russia, Ukraine, and uh, also in the Far East, wanted to bring you an update on the financial markets so that you can help prepare your families for what's coming. And not only prepare financially, which uh, we help you to do with our great partnership with St. Joseph Partners, who are really, really highly rated and trustworthy folks who sell gold, who sell silver, who enable people to make safe investments for their families, but uh, also wanted to talk about spiritual preparation and um, how that's important and the ways to do it properly. Our guest today on the John Henry Weston Show is Drew Mason, uh, who is the founder and head of St. Joseph's Partners. Stay tuned. Hello, dear LifeSite family. The very first Christmas was a dark time. With the world in the clutches of a foreign and hostile power, and with religious leaders betraying God and their flocks at every opportunity. But yet, it was in that very time that the angels joyfully announced to the shepherds the birth of the long awaited Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, Jesus the Christ. And we are in very similar times again. Millions of people worldwide are searching for truth and light as our fragile world seems to be growing darker by the day. Our work at LifeSite News results from an unwavering trust in our holy call to evangelize, to bring the world the truth, ultimately the fullness of the truth himself. At LifeSite, we pledge ourselves anew to boldly ring out the truth of Christ on life, faith, family, and freedom. We're in the midst of our second annual Gifts of Gratitude Christmas campaign and invite you to join us in celebrating LifeSite News' special way of sharing reflections and reactions directly from the heart about what truly motivates us here to work for you on the front lines of the culture war. So during our Christmas campaign, we must raise $750,000 in order to meet the minimum amount required to keep our news mission and operations going. So we rely on your gracious help and support to keep our truthful news mission going, especially as we close 2023 and embrace the lean and early winter months. This is our largest goal of the entire year and one that requires each of you to prayerfully consider a donation. Please know that any amount helps. To give your own personal gift of gratitude, you can donate by clicking on the big red banner at the main homepage of LifeSite News or the giving link that can be found below in the video description box. It is only through your love, prayers, and generous support for our mission that we are able to continue reporting the truth without compromise. This Christmas season, let each of us do what we can to be the light that we are called to be in this culture of darkness and so we can enable the truth himself to shine ever so brightly as a result. So I want to thank you so much for your unwavering support and continued prayers for LifeSite News. And I pray you have a happy and holy Christmas. May God bless you. Drew, so good to be with you again. Praise be Jesus. Great to see you, John Henry. Let's begin as we always do with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So, Drew, if we can start off with what's going on financially, because I know many of us are, are paying attention to the world and what's happening there. We see the uh, war in the Holy Land. We see Russia, Ukraine still going on and uh, noises from the Far East as well. There's so much instability in our world. How is that being reflected in the financial markets? And why should Catholics be concerned to prepare for themselves and their families. Thank you, John Henry. So since we've been together, the events have been extremely noteworthy in the markets too. The headlines may hold up one story to tell, 
But what we see happening is a greater focus, and I would say an urgency being displayed on the part of governments to sell, reduce their holdings in dollar assets, T-bills, T-bonds, and moving into gold. So 2023 will be a record year where the world's central banks who control all the money that we use, who really control the savings of the working class, they're voting with their wallets, sell dollars, buy gold. We have even had, since we spoke last, John Henry, at least one of the European central banks admit that they are preparing for a new gold standard. The central banks, really everyone around the world, is recognizing the dollar's day as a sole reserve currency is ending. And when you look at the price of gold in world currencies, it's hitting all-time highs. And not only is it hitting an all-time high, but the rate of change is accelerating meaning the speed in which gold is, gold's price is ascending relative to these world currencies is getting faster. The, the curve is getting steeper. People are saying we need to have some gold. It's an incredible admission for the central banks to say, yes, the reason we are buying gold is because we see this new paradigm unfolding where we'll be back to where we were previously in financial history, that the world will use gold as a currency for trading and for wealth preservation. In addition, John Henry, we had an extremely noteworthy comment article come out, and it was written by one of the most respected investors of our generation, who is the former CEO of PIMCO Asset Management. PIMCO runs over a trillion dollars, that's T, trillion with a T, most of it in bonds. And what he admitted is that we are seeing the U.S. Treasury bond, which is denominated in dollars, we are seeing it, quote unquote, lose its strategic significance, end quote. So really, all financial advisors today build their models, their recommendations to families upon this notion that the T-bill, the dollar, is the risk, what they call the risk-free asset. It's as close as to perfect safety as you can get. And when you look at the construction of portfolios, this is still the, the rubrics that they are using. Now, what this PIMCO CEO is admitting is this is totally flawed. The foundation upon which Americans and families around the world are building their financial futures on is broken. And it begs the question, okay, well, if that's the case, isn't history again going to manifest itself that a currency like the dollar and all of its instruments, CDs, T-bills, T-bonds, aren't they, as has always happened in history, going to see their value, the purchasing power they represent implode? And that's what he is suggesting we are in the early innings of. When that happens, people look for something that is safe and liquid. And when they begin asking themselves then, what is safe? They're going to be reminded, not just the last 50 years or 100 years, but going back as far as we can find in financial history, gold has worked. And so we think that is the insight that these central banks are uh, looking at to give them this uh, urgency to diversify into gold. So we would say to all families out there, we are called to be good stewards. You concluded, John Henry, by saying, why should Catholic families do something? We're concluded to be good stewards. Joseph protected his family and led them, got them out of trouble when his child was potentially going to be persecuted from Bethlehem. We are called to be good stewards. And financially, how are you going to look yourself in the mirror? How are you going to be accountable for the blessings that you've been entrusted with so far when this accelerates and the dollars lose their, their value? To say, I had, a, you know, I knew this was going to happen, but I just didn't do anything about it. I stood there like a deer in headlights. It's not difficult. It shouldn't be scary. This is not Armageddon. This is saying the sun's going to come up the day after the dollar paradigm ends. It's a question, have you taken the steps necessary to be ready so that your family can have great opportunities for the future? As this new financial paradigm unfolds, he who has the goal will have greater influence. And we want Christians to have even greater influence in society moving forward. 
And again, the ability to protect your family, give them great opportunities. It's interesting you mentioned St. Joseph there because in gifting his son uh, at his birth, our Lord chose to bring the wise men there who gifted them with, yes, frankincense and myrrh, but also with gold um, right from the get-go. So uh, it's just an interesting thing there. If you have a comment about that. It's embarrassing, John Henry, but when we named this firm St. Joseph Partners, we didn't have this big understanding of why we were doing that. We just felt led to do it and, and obeyed. And as you reflect on the life of St. Joseph, isn't he so representative of us today, right? The government clearly hated his family. They wanted to kill his, his, his family. And he figured out, obviously with great help from the Holy Spirit, a role model for us, he looked to the Holy Spirit and had great inspiration on how to protect his family. And in all likelihood, having just been given gold, Gold may have been central to how they functioned as he led them out into the desert and into Africa for three years. Because back then, as is the case today, if you have gold, wherever you are in the world, you have liquidity, you have wealth, the ability to protect him and care for your family. I liked what you said there, that we want Christians to have a means of influence in the world. Let's, let's talk about that, because there's different opinions out there about you know, wealth and Christianity and what we're supposed to do with it. And um, talk to us a little bit about that, because I think it's a really interesting concept. There is a concept within, it was, it's in Judaism, it was there in ancient Judaism, but also in um, Protestant cultures actually have it, much more than Catholics, uh, I find anyway, that they support one another inside the faith community. They have a preferential option for other Jews and other Protestants, but we seem to be a bit lacking, well, more than a bit lacking in that regard inside the Catholic Church. You are 100% right, John Henry. And the timeliness of what you're saying is interesting because the recent daily mass reading reflected on, if we don't care for our own, we are worse than infidel which is the worst the scripture describes. If we don't care for our own, we are worse than infidel. So in my opinion, John Henry, Jesus warned us about people who would be in Roman collars, who would be wolves in sheep's clothing, who would, who would destroy as best they could the church. And in my opinion, what we see the bishops doing, having taken billions of dollars from the US government, and then choosing to walk away from proclaiming the faith and instead to exercise their role aiding the U.S. government with illegal immigrants and preaching to people to go and take your money and go to foreign nations and build houses for people you don't know or do whatever it is. In contrast, what Jesus did when he sent out his apostles was singular. He told them to evangelize and he sent them first to his own. And so if you think about it, and you pray about it, I think you're going to conclude that one of the many important and one of the, one of the most important uh, uh, strategies for Satan to destroy the church has been that he would use the influence of bishops to speak and guide Catholics who care about their faith, essentially to walk away from evangelization and to go do social justice. Instead, what we should be doing is bringing the faith to our own. We have an absolute epidemic. Where is the epidemic? It's right now in the Catholic Church with our youth and with our families. Dropout rates, 90%. 90%. What's the percent of those people who are going to make it to heaven? Who knows? Why? Because when they've been in Catholic schools, they haven't been formed correctly. They haven't been taught scripture. Because Jesus said, you're easily fooled because you don't know scripture. It's not a coincidence our children are not taught scripture. So just think, if we can get some of these leaders, lay leaders, and I call out to you, decide that you are not going to support financially the diocese or this charity or that charity that's social. You are going to focus on evangelization, on reaching out to the kids, whether it's you know yourselves hiring people to go out and, and minister to these children to, to teach them, or some of the great uh, organizations that are already in place to do this. This is what we have to do to take back the church. I submit, John Henry, that right now, if we could see our youth as heaven sees it, it is 
it is set to be a field ablaze. All we need is just a little spark of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see as scripture describes the, the fire start going through the stubble at an incredible rate. The youth are so hungry. They have been face to face with evil. They are empty from the way they've been formed. They are looking for the light. And if we will take it to them, if you will take it to them, they will respond. And this is how we'll renew the church. And then as we're reading about in scriptures today at the masses, God lets the nation suffer. He lets suffering goes on. He lets horrible leadership take place. He lets injustice reign until we repent. And that is the first job of us as Christians and as evangelists is to say, let's go, let's repent, let's obey the Lord. And once we do that, then the blessings will come and we will take back our church and we will take back our country. What you're saying there, Drew, is, is quite controversial. Hey, my friends, are you still looking for a Christmas gift for that someone special on your list who seems to have everything? Well, I've got something for you. We've got these beautiful silver rounds. They're one ounce of pure silver. And on it is, of course, a picture of LifeSite commemorating our 25th anniversary, but also the anniversary of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Perfect little gift for that person on your list who has everything. God bless you. And I agree with you 100% that the, the over-focus on, on the care for the poor, the, the, this sort of outreach, it's become sort of the only thing. Um, it, it seems like the whole focus of the church, right, from Pope Francis down, is against, actually, evangelization, proselytization, as it's, as it's characterized or caricatured. And it is work with the poor, for the poor, do this, that, and the other thing, everything but evangelize. And I want to bring to mind something that Mother Miriam said, which I think was so accurate, but deemed even to be dangerous. Because she said something rather stunning. She said, the greatest form of anti-Semitism is keeping Jesus from the Jews. And it's so stunning because she means it to include the whole of Nazism and everything else. She's saying that the greatest form of anti-Semitism was not even under the Nazis. It's when we refuse to evangelize our Jewish brothers and sisters, our Islamic brothers and sisters, Buddhist, go down the list. If we're not bringing Jesus to them, we are harming. If we purposefully deny them Christ, we are inviting damnation in our own heads as well. It's, it's really stunning. And you're called to invest in evangelization is, I think, the most important call. The scriptures tell us, seek first the kingdom of God and all the rest shall be given to you. I love your take. Supporting what you're saying, allow me to share a scripture passage that I don't think most Catholics are aware of. This is from Sirach chapter 12. So you can look this up yourselves. When you do a good deed, Make sure you know who is benefiting from it. Then what you do will not be wasted. You won't be repaid for any kindness you show to a devout person. If he doesn't repay you the most high will, no good ever comes to a person who gives comfort to the wicked. It is not a righteous act. Give to religious people, but don't help sinners. Do good to humble people, but don't give anything to those who are not devout. Don't give them food or they will use your kindness against you. Every good thing you do for such people will bring you twice as much trouble in return. The Most High himself hates sinners and he will punish them. Give to good people, but do not help sinners. Wait, wait, that was all from... The scriptures? Yes, that was Sirach chapter 12. That was not me. That is Sirach chapter 12. And we'll get that to you and you can put it up what, there. What verses, what verses are those? Sirach chapter 12? I believe that is verse 1 through 7. We'll get that to you for sure. But if you think about that and you relate that to Jesus, again, think about he his comments. We had Mary at his feet adoring him, right? A, a, prim, a, a prelude to the Eucharist adoring him. And Martha said, get her off her knees, get her out here and help me 
to serve the food. And Jesus said, Mary has chosen the better part. Now later we see Martha clearly learn from that and, and, and embrace that as we want to lead with adoring Jesus. What did Mother Teresa say, the patron saint perhaps of our ages? She didn't say the world will be renewed when everyone goes out and helps a poor person. She said the world will be renewed when every parish has adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. So she's seeing what is job one, what is most important. And again, think about what Jesus did. He said, the poor you always have with us, but he, cha he, he, he channeled the apostles. He sent them out two by two. He didn't isolate them like our current bishops have isolated our current priests, he sent them out two by two to go out and evangelize. So it is the most politically incorrect charity to talk about Jesus and making him the center of our, our world. And the fact that it's so incorrect should be a hint to us that it is so important. You raise an interesting point there, and it would sound to many like the perfect counterpoint to what you said, because you raised Mother Teresa. Um, isn't she the model of helping the poor and not evangelizing? Great question, John Henry. And we are hopeful that the missionaries of charity will have a, a conversation with us to really delve into this in, in a public venue about that. But again, those are her words that if you want to renew the if you want to renew the world, we have to have adoration first. And I think John Henry, you know, the, one of the greatest scripture scholars of all time is Satan, right? He was quoting scripture to Jesus. He knows it. And he takes the scriptures and he twists them for his own benefit. And I, and I believe one of the words he likes to use most in the notions is love. It's really not love. It's really misplaced love, or in some cases, outright disobedience to the Lord, right? When he came to Peter and the church was just founded, Peter was just made the rock. He was a leader. That whole scene in scripture, which is why you and I are Catholic to this day. He didn't go to Peter and say, hey, Peter, I'm Satan. I want to destroy Jesus. I want to destroy the church. I'm a nobody, but I'm just full of hate. Let's go destroy him. He knew that wouldn't have worked. So we see him reaching out, whispering to Peter, hey, Peter, you love Jesus, don't you? Peter, if you, do you love him? Well, Peter, if you love him, you can't let him crucify him. Come on, Peter, are you a man? Stand up. Do something. Peter, don't just sit there and let them do that to him. We see Peter is so worked up by Satan with, with his good heart. He goes out and, and Jesus says, Satan, get behind me. The only time he ever describes anyone and addresses anyone as Satan in the scriptures was to the person who was at that moment in time our first pontiff, our first church leader. And when we see scriptures that can be interpreted in different ways, I, I submit, John Henry, what we want to do is we want to look at the scripture that is the most definitive, that is the most clear, and overlay that to scripture that is more ambiguous or vague, right? So scriptures clearly talk to us about loving. Um, what is love, though? To Mother Miriam's point, love is carrying the gospel. That's the ultimate love, right? So that someone doesn't miss out on heaven. And who should we love? His brothers, he said, right? Who are his brothers? We talked about at the top of the show. His brothers and his sisters are those who obey the commandments. That's who we should be beginning with, with our charity. And then it talks about, you know, um, giving to others. But what did St. Paul say? He was crystal clear, work or starve. So was St. Paul full of hate, full of hate, or is that actually love? Counseling someone who is depending on other people's charity, that's not going to go well with the Lord. You got to pick yourself up and you got to work or start. Again, those are not my words. Who cares what I say? This is exactly what the scripture, what the scriptures say. So I submit, John Henry, we're not putting any effort, any time into evangelization. We're putting it all into social justice. And it's not working well. It's not working well. We want to go to evangelization and let the Holy Spirit rain down. And I want to, I want to make sure this is coming across in a wrapper of optimism and hope and enthusiasm for the future. Because it, one of the most beautiful realities is that even on Satan's had to pump so much money, so much effort into all these lies to get people to believe them. But we just need one witness like you watching this show to go out and talk to a high school student or to support an evangelization program at a school. 
just one witness. And that'll be the Holy Spirit getting into that child. And that'll be the spark that runs ablaze. So it's really a very une uneven playing field to our advantage if we'll just focus like our Lord encouraged his, like our Lord led the apostles to focus and turn to him. Wanted to just answer some of, you know, the thought vis-a-vis -vis Mother Teresa. Unlike a lot of the missionary work you might say today by lay people, even orders, who refuse to wear a habit Mother Teresa was very insistent about wearing a religious habit. Everyone knew who she was and who her sisters were because they wore a religious habit. They were the brides of Christ. There was no question. Anybody thought, oh, maybe this is someone else. This is someone not related to Catholicism. This is someone who is just working out of charity and we love her and only her and we don't give a thought to where she comes from. No. In fact, she made it known as well that they had hours of adoration every day um, themselves. And this is the power that uh, from which she drew. Um, and of course she did. Um, even baptize uh, some of the people who asked for baptism because she let her actions being the hands of Christ, the eyes of Christ, the voice of Christ uh, manifest to them in a way that wasn't overbearing. It couldn't be said of her that she was forcing religion down anyone's throat. But what she was doing is demonstrating it. Her work, I think, is rightfully described as a work of evangelization rather than anything else, more, more so than a work of a charity for the poor and whatever else. It's a true charity for the poor. She, of course, knew the greatest form of evangelization is not to save the body, it's to save them for eternal life. So she did exactly that. Um, although the, the, I think, false caricature of her is the one that's all about um, helping the poor and trying to not evangelize. That, that is a false characterization. Her sisters, also still around in the world today, um, have that same you know, spirit of evangelization. And uh, her great courage shone when in the face of the most powerful on earth, the Clintons, when she came to the America, she talked about abortion. The worst thing to talk about with the Clintons, but there she was. And talking also about the greater poverty in the West because of our lack of faith than they have in India with all of the physical poor and uh, destitution that goes on there. Absolutely stunning. And there she was, John Henry, following Jesus's model for the day, each day, right? So many times in scripture, we see Jesus going out well before dawn, well before sunrise, during the fourth watch to pray. And that's the model she followed too, that we, pro we should all be following, whether we're doctors, school teachers, students, to just begin the day with him in prayer, adoring him. And then whatever else it is we are called to do, we'll have a totally different spirit and tone about it. I'd love to talk to you about that last bit too, because that is an important thing. Whatever we're called to do, how do you get there? How do you know what you're called to do? Day to day, we have the time that we're allotted. How do we spend it? How do we pay attention to what God wants us to do? And how do we know what that is? How do we carry it out? All the youth who are watching this, how can you make any important decisions without praying about it? You have a ticket. You have an opportunity to sit down one-on-one -on -one with the CEO of the universe who turns the lights on in the sun every morning and who is incredibly focused on just you and all the details. You took the time to number the hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. But he's not going to force himself on you. He wants to be invited into your life. So I submit we do just what, we, what our Lord did. And that is get up early when the Spirit most likes to talk, right? That's why Jesus went out early. That's when we see the Spirit talking and God visiting humanity in the Garden of Eden at fourth watch, which is about 3 to 6 a.m. Get up early and reach out to him begin by praising him. That's what we're supposed to do. Our prayer should be dominated by praise. 
not gimme, 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 but praise. Just realizing how awesome you are, how majestic you are, and singing to him, right? How many times does scripture say to sing? So even early in the morning there, just praising him, singing. I submit we read scriptures. My favorite scripture study tool is the daily readings at Mass. It's what's going to be the most widely studied scripture passages in the world that day. There are no coincidences. That's what's on the Spirit's mind. And then after you've consumed that, I encourage you to pray the rosary and just ask him, you know, say to him, what would you have me do in this specific situation? Where should I go to school? What, what should I pursue? And just be ready for very gentle thoughts to start flowing through your mind. And if the thought contradicts the commandments or scripture, you know it's not from God. But if it is not in contradiction to those, then it's fair game to discern. And if it's a thought that has a peace to it and has a, a, it stays with you, it doesn't just fly out you know, uh, your ear and you forget about it right away, but you remember it, it has that power. If it's a thought maybe you hadn't had before, those are all the fingerprints of the Lord trying to gently whisper to you, say to you, this is what's best for you. And contrary to what Satan seems to try to do with so many youth, where he seems to say, oh, if you don't want to do that, then that must be the Lord's will. The Spirit's full of joy. Look for a quickening in your spirit that you say, yeah, that, that sounds good. I'd like to do that. If it makes you uh, excited about it, then that's another good sign that it's the Lord revealing his plan to you. Because again, his scriptures say, I have plans to prosper you. He desires that we would be healthy and happy. He's giving us the tools to do that. And today, to the youth, I would say, please start fasting as well as we are obligated to do. I know your pastors don't tell you we're obligated to fast each week, but we are. And this is the spiritual army that the spiritual armor that Our Lady said is so powerful that it keeps evil away from us. Imagine if evil just had to back off of your family, couldn't be trying to wreck the lives of your children or your loved ones. You will find, because remember, that's how Jesus started his ministry, right? 40 days of fasting to make sure he was hearing the Lord correctly. Do that. And I think you're going to find how exciting it is that the Lord wants to speak directly to you, not only through a teacher or through maybe a spiritual advisor, but he wants to talk, the spirit wants to talk directly to you. And I think you'll find it exhilarating. I need to remind everyone, we've got a show out with Drew uh, about prayer and fasting, about fasting Wednesdays and Fridays, as the early church did in the Didache. It, talks us about, it tells us about doing that, a bread and water fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, as the early church used to do. So stunning stuff. I encourage you to go watch that. Also. Drew, I want to thank you for your advice to families on how to prepare themselves for the times to come, um, both spiritually um, and also financially, uh, in a way to prosper God's people. God bless you, Drew, and thank you. Thank you, John Henry. And God bless all of you. And we'll see you next time. Hi, everyone. This is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.